Hello, thank you for inviting me to give this year's O'Hara Philosophy of Physics lecture. I'm so sorry not to be with you in person, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. I want to thank in particular the sponsors of this lecture series, Patrick O'Hara and Katerina Randolph, as well as the philosophy department, and especially Andrea Woody and Ben Feintzai. So thank you, thank you for watching this, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's begin. And let's start with something we're all familiar with. We all know that today physics and philosophy are housed in different departments. In my university at Duke, they're even housed on different campuses. They are distinct disciplines with their own journals and conferences. And in general, they're practiced by different people using different tools and different methods. But as you also know, this was not always the case. Up until at least the early 17th century, physics was a part of philosophy. So what happened and why? The standard story we tell ourselves is that this separation took place during the 17th century. As a vivid illustration, compare the fate of Descartes' principles of philosophy with that of Newton's Principia. These were published less than 50 years apart, Descartes in 1644, and Newton's in 1687. And there's considerable overlap between the two projects. And yet, Descartes' Principles of Philosophy is taught today in philosophy departments, and we think of it as a text in the history of philosophy, whereas Newton's Principia, or to give it its full title in English, is Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, is not taught as a canonical text in philosophy. It's claimed by physicists for the history of physics. One explanation might be this. Sometime between the two, the scientific revolution took place, yielding Newton's Principia as its crowning achievement. In the process, physics achieved autonomy from philosophy, leaving Descartes' principles behind. By the end of the 17th century, physics had flown the philosopher's nest, and the 18th century saw physicists doing what Thomas Kuhn called normal science. They were working within the new Newtonian paradigm for classical physics, solving problems using the resources Newton had provided. <clears throat> but this is not really how it happened. There is no doubt that important developments in natural philosophy took place in the 17th century, and that Newton's Principia was enormously influential for the evolving relationship between physics and philosophy. But as of the early 18th century, the split between physics and philosophy had yet to take place. To see that, one thing we can do is look at the leading physicists of the time and at how they described their own discipline. I'll give you an example in a minute. What this means is that if we want to see the split between physics and philosophy unfold and to understand the philosophical reasons for it, then we have to look not only before Newton's Principia, but after it too. And that's what we're going to do today. The big picture takeaway of these. First, in the 18th century, just as much as in the 17th, physics was all about bodies, their nature, properties, behaviors, and causal powers. This is the sense in which physics was a part of philosophy. It was that subdiscipline of philosophy charged with the study of bodies. This is going to be important for our story, so we'll come back to it. The second takeaway is the important role that collision theory played in driving physics out of the philosopher's nest. In the end, it's all about collisions. If you know anything about the scientific revolution, this will be surprising. After all, there are many things we know were important for the changes that took place in how we do physics. These changes happened during the scientific revolution. Some familiar themes are the mathematization of nature, the shift from the finite spherical cosmos of the Aristotelian philosophy to the infinite space of Newton's Principia, the increased emphasis on observations and experiments, and the mechanization of nature. These are all important and there are others that too, but none of them explains why it was that physics split away from philosophy and gained the kind of autonomy that it has today. Our second takeaway today is that if we want to understand what happened, then we need to include collisions in our story. 
I know this doesn't sound hugely exciting, thinking about 17th and 18th century collision theory, um, but it turns out to be super important for the relationship between physics and philosophy. Okay. So let's take a look at the conception of physics at the time. As I mentioned already, at the beginning of the 18th century, a generation after Newton's Principia, physics was still very much a part of philosophy. And one way to see this is to look at what the leading physicists at the time said about their own discipline. Here's one example. This is Muschenbroek. He was a professor of mathematics. He was a leading experimentalist. He was a fellow of the Royal Society of London. Um, I think today he's most famous for his work on electrostatics and his invention of the Leiden jar. Um, so here's what he says in his textbook from the 1720s, where he gives a nice taxonomy of philosophy. He says, philosophy is the knowledge of all things, both divine and human, and of their properties, operations, causes, and effects, which may be known by the understanding, the senses, reason, or by any other way whatever. Philosophy is a very ample science and therefore ought to be divided into certain parts, which we shall reduce to the following six. Pneumatics, which comprehends whatever belongs to spiritual existences, their attributes and operations. Physics. Sorry. Physics, which considers the space of the whole universe and all bodies contained in it inquires into their nature, attributes, properties, actions, passions, situation, order, powers, causes, effects, modes, magnitudes, origins. Teleology, which investigates the ends for the sake of which all things in the universe have their existence and all their actions, changes and motions are performed. Metaphysics, which explains such general things as are in common to all created beings, as what is being, substance, mode, relation, possible, impossible, necessary, contingent, etc. Moral philosophy gives us rules by which we should direct all our actions. Logic, which considers the intelligent and reasoning faculty of the human mind and instructs us in the methods of reasoning justly and of avoiding error. So the first thing to notice is that physics is a part of philosophy. And the second important thing is the characterization of physics. Physics is the study of bodies, their natures, properties, powers, causes, effects, and so on. This was a widely held picture at the time, these two elements, physics being a part of philosophy and physics being the study of bodies um, in the way that I just described. I've given you just one example, but my talk today draws on work that I've been doing with another philosopher, Marius Stan, and he and I have a great long list of people from the 18th century all of whom say exactly these same two things about physics. It's a subfield of philosophy, and it's a subfield tasked with studying bodies in general, their natures, properties, behaviors, powers, causes, effects, and so forth. So keep this conception of physics in mind. It's important for what happened to physics in the 18th century. But now let's turn our attention to collisions. Here, the outline of the story looks like this. In the 17th century, collisions became foundational for physics, for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. And the search gets underway for an adequate theory of collisions. Then in the early 18th century, this task of giving an adequate theory of collisions turns into a really big problem. And we're gonna see why that was. And then finally, we'll see how this struggle with collisions played out in the mid to late 18th century and the way that it transformed physics. One of the familiar themes of the 17th century and the scientific revolution is the rise of the mechanical philosophy. The idea that the only difference between a man-made machine, such as a lever or a pulley or a mechanical clock, the only difference between those and the natural world, trees, tides, planets, ducks, um, is the complexity and perfection of their design. The universe is just one giant machine made up of lots of smaller machines. One version of this mechanical philosophy was offered by Descartes in his Principles of Philosophy that I mentioned earlier. Descartes offered mechanical explanations of everything from magnetism to fire to planetary motions. His physics, Cartesian physics, was the dominant cutting edge 
leading approach to physics in the mid 17th century. And his theory of planetary motion was Newton's major competitor. Here's a picture of what it looked like. Um, so what you can see here, so the, you know, the S there at the center of that um, one system, that S is our sun, that this is our um, solar system, and the other dots are the other um, known planets at the time. And there's matter filling the entire universe. And this matter is being swept, is sweeping around the sun in a vortex. And that's what's carrying the planets around. The reason that planets move in the orbits that they do around the sun is because they're being carried along in the plenum by this material vortex that's sweeping planets around. And there, as you can see, um, there are other regions of the universe that have other stars at the center and vortices around them. Um, and then that pathway across the top, then um, that's the path of a comet. Okay, so everything in Descartes' physics happens by collisions. He tries to explain everything by appeal to little bits of matter moving around and colliding with one another. He has three laws of nature. These are antecedents of Newton's laws of motion. And later he added some extra rules of collision. And then everything from magnetism to the operation of our own senses to the planetary motions you see here, everything is to be explained in terms of collisions. Collisions are the only means by which bodies interact and act on one another. So collisions have an utterly foundational place in Cartesian physics, and they're equally foundational for anyone who adopted the new mechanical philosophy as, a, as an approach to doing physics. Good, okay. So since collisions are foundational, our physics is going to need a theory of collisions. And it turns out that this involves two things. First, you need rules of collision that tell you what happens when two bodies collide. But here we run into a problem because Descartes' laws of nature and his rules of collision weren't very successful when it comes to predicting the outcomes of collisions. This got fixed pretty quickly. In the mid 1660s, the Royal Society of London asked various people for their theories of motion and collision. And by December 1668, they had in hand information about rules of collision from Christian Huygens, Christopher Wren, and John Wallace. And these are basically the collision rules we have in classical mechanics today for perfectly elastic and inelastic collisions. The other piece is an explanation of why those rules hold in terms of the nature, properties, powers, and causes of bodies. So remember back to the standard conception of physics that we saw in Muschenbroek as the study of bodies in general, including their nature, properties, powers, causes, and so forth. Well, any satisfactory theory of collisions is going to have to address this requirement. It will have to provide not just the rules of collision, but an explanation of why those rules hold in terms of the nature of bodies. So let me give you an example of what this looked like. This is Malebranche. He was the leading Cartesian in France at the turn of the century. And here's how his collision theory works. He thinks that all matter is soft and then soft bodies are just regions of soft matter. Hard bodies are also regions of soft matter that have been compressed by the surrounding subtle matter. So remember how Descartes had a plenum, the whole universe is filled with fine matter, there's no empty space and it's all swirling around. Malebranche is the same, there's subtle matter everywhere um, in all the gaps between bodies. Um, and as it moves around, it compresses regions of soft matter, regions of soft matter become then hard bodies. Um, elastic bodies are also regions of soft matter, but this time they have pores in them, and these pores are filled with soft matter. And the first thing Malebranche does is to explain what happens to the shapes of these bodies when they collide. And then he uses this shape behavior to try to explain the outcome of collisions. That is, he uses the shape behavior of his different kinds of bodies to try to explain why the different rules of collision hold. So for example, in the case of elastic bodies, when they collide, the subtle matter is squeezed out of the pores during the initial phase of impact. So the body deforms and compresses 
but then this subtle matter rushes back in during the second stage so that the body recovers its initial state shape. Um, and this is why, according to Malebranche, elastic bodies rebound. The Newtonians do something similar. Um, so for example, John Kyle, who was a leading advocate of Newton and of Newton's physics, um, he's the one who was heavily involved in the calculus dispute with Leibniz, if you know about that. Um, he gave lectures on physics at Oxford at the beginning of the 18th century. And in these, he divides bodies into three kinds, hard, soft, and elastic, just like Malebranche. So he divides them into three kinds according to their material properties, and then tries to give a causal explanation of why the rules of collision hold given these material properties. So he's doing essentially the same thing of, as Malebranche, just with slightly different kind of, sort of Newtonian resources. If you're a physicist at that time, you're expected to provide causal explanations of the behaviors of bodies in terms of their nature, properties, powers, and so forth. And so we see Malebranche doing that, trying to recover the rules of collision from his theory of matter. And we see Kyle um, giving accounts of his three kinds of bodies in terms of their material properties, and then trying to explain why the rules of collision hold given those material properties. By the early 18th century, the leading approaches to physics um, included these. They were roughly the Cartesian approach and the Newtonian approach, and then also the Leibnizian. So just to complete the picture, let's have a quick look at Leibniz and his follow followers. Now, of course, um, the people at the time, they're not, they don't fall strictly into these three camps. Um, people are drawing on what resources they need and everyone's their own person, they're thinking differently. But roughly speaking, we can think of, um, physics is divided into Cartesian physics, Newtonian physics, and Leibnizian physics. Um, so let's have a quick look at Leibniz and his followers. As of the, as of, um, early, the early 1600s, Leibniz is active, he's getting involved, and in 1669, already um, at the time of the Royal Society investigations into collisions that I mentioned earlier, Leibniz complained that the Huygens, Wren, Wallace rules of collision were incomplete because they lacked a causal explanation of what happens during a collision. And Leibniz is still unhappy in the early 18th century, challenging Malebranche's account and pointing out problems with it. He himself introduced a complicated theory of forces so that bodies are themselves endowed with these forces. And this is what explains their behavior when they collide. So again, you start with the nature of bodies, their properties and powers, and then you use that to explain why the collision rules hold. As of the late 17th, 17th and early 18th century, everyone's at it. Why? Because collisions are at the foundation of physics at the time. And philosophers and physicists who were working at that time might reasonably have expected that a satisfactory theory of collisions would be forthcoming. The trouble is, it wasn't. So here's where we are. First, we've seen that as of the early 18th century, physics was still thought of as a subdiscipline of philosophy. So the separation that we're looking for hasn't happened yet. We've also seen that physics at that time was the study of bodies in general, their nature, properties, powers, and so forth. Second, we've seen that collisions had a foundational place in physics at that time. We've seen that there were two elements that were required for a satisfactory theory of collisions, rules of collision, and also an explanation of why those rules hold in terms of the nature, properties, and powers of bodies. Finally, we've seen that as of the early 18th century, even though everyone tried to give a theory of collision, there wasn't a satisfactory one out there. And it's this pressure this failure of philosophy to provide a satisfactory account of collisions that I think ends up driving physics out of the philosopher's nest. So the next thing I want to do is talk about the ramping up of this pressure and what that led to. As we move further into the 18th century, the problem was beginning to feel acute. In the 1720s, the Paris Academy of Sciences offered two prize competitions on the topic of collisions. In 1724, the Academy invited submissions 
um, on the topic of which of the laws whereby perfectly hard body, whereby a perfectly hard body in motion will move another body of the same nature through collision, be it in a vacuum or in a plenum. Part of the problem here is that some people thought that hard bodies would rebound and others thought they wouldn't. There aren't any perfectly hard bodies that we have empirical access to, so how should we decide? If we have an account of the nature and properties of hard bodies and can use this to derive the rules of hard body collision, then that would help. But in fact, the submissions to the competition made the problems with trying to do this even more visible. Even the most successful submissions simply begged the question by presuming a connection between being a hard body and not rebounding, for example. Worse than that, the entries also drew attention to the problems with elastic body collisions. So in 1726, the topic was the laws of impact between bodies with recoil, perfect or imperfect, deduced from a probable explanation of the physical cause of recoil. You can see here the explicit attention to the physical cause of rebound and the requirement that the rules of collision be derived from this underlying physical cause. Once again, there were various different kinds of submissions, including ones that use subtle matter to explain elasticity. So just like Malebranche, um, they have, there are pores and little vortices of subtle matter in these pores. And this behavior is somehow going to give us um, the elastic behavior and thereby the rebound behavior. Um, but none of these submissions resolve the issues to kind of general satisfaction. So the pressure is continuing to build and people keep trying. In 1740, in her Foundations of Physics, Emily du Châtelet gives the most worked out attempt from that time that I've found. Now, du Châtelet is very, very interesting. Her Foundations of Physics is a kind of state of the discipline type book where she draws on the best of all the different approaches to physics at the time, Cartesian, Newtonian, Leibnizian, and puts together a systematic physics that makes clear where the holes are and what the problems are. She does the best I've seen with collisions, but it doesn't work. And notice that this leaves philosophy in a tricky spot. Collisions are supposed to be one of the ways, if not the only way, in which bodies act on one another. So if we don't have an account of collisions, then we don't have an account of bodily action. And this calls into question whether we have a viable account of bodies at all. Bodies are supposed to be the kinds of things that act on one another. This is a problem not just for physics, but for philosophy quite generally. Any area of philosophy that involved bodies and bodies acting on one another relied on an account of bodies provided by physics. And this includes human bodies. To have an account of human bodily action, one must first have an account of bodily action generally. After all, if I'm to use my hand to help you up from your chair, my body must act on yours. To turn on the light, I must move the switch. In the 1730s, Du Châtelet worried about free will. And for her, an account of how it is that one body can act on another is a prerequisite for building an account of free human action. This makes the problem of bodily action relevant, not just for natural philosophy, but for moral and political philosophy too. In the early decades of the 18th century, these disparate areas of philosophy shared a common conception of body and bodily action, one that was supposed to be provided by physics. So not having a viable theory of collisions, the means by which one body acts on another, is a really big deal. So I hope the general picture is clear. Philosophers were looking for a physics of collisions, but they couldn't find what they were looking for. We are 100 years on from Descartes' principles of philosophy, 50 years on from Newton's Principia, and what seemed like an unproblematic part of physics is resisting attempts to get it under theoretical control. This happens a lot in physics, right? Um, you can be stuck looking for a theoretical breakthrough, and when it doesn't come, you don't know whether that's because no one's been smart enough to figure it out yet, or because you need to change what you're looking for. I think Einstein's special theory of relativity is a particularly good example of this, and there are plenty of others. So what to do? 
Well, for philosophers at the time in the early 18th century, there is another place to look and that's mechanics. And this is an important point. It wasn't just the philosophers who were submitting papers on collisions to the Paris Academy Prize competitions. It was also mathematicians. And at the time, whereas philosophers were responsible for physics, the mathematicians were responsible for mechanics. Physics and mechanics were distinct disciplines. This can seem puzzling to those of us who use the labels classical physics and classical mechanics interchangeably, even when thinking about the 18th century and such figures as Euler, D'Alembert and Lagrange. Nevertheless, if we're following the story, story forwards in time, rather than looking backwards through our present day spectacles, then we have to keep them distinct. In mechanics, mathematicians studied traditional problems in statics, such as the mathematical treatment of the lever, as well as new problems involving motion, such as the pendulum, the compound pendulum, the bracket stone, bead on a wire. Um, some people at the time, including some of the most influential figures of the period, were both philosophers and mathematicians, but the two disciplines were distinct. They had distinct methods, distinct goals, and distinct domains of authority. It was the job of physics to provide the general account of bodies. And then the mathematicians took those bodies, abstracted away the properties that they considered relevant to the mathematical treatment of the motions of bodies and worked with those. The mathematicians took for granted that philosophers had an account of bodies and of how bodies act on one another and got on with their mathematical theories of mechanics. But in the middle of the 18th century, this began to change. And this is also the point in our story where physics starts to get plucked out of the philosopher's nest. Let's see how this goes. Here are two giants of the 18th century, Euler and D'Alembert. Euler worked on absolutely everything in mathematics, mechanics, physics, and astronomy. A biography came out a couple of years ago by uh, Ronald Callinger, and it's about 600 pages long. Euler is a towering figure, um, and he's also pretty interesting as a philosopher, um, but philosophers of physics haven't really looked at him yet. Um, so there's a lot of work to do there. Um, here are two important things that Euler did. First, in 1736, he published the first volume of his Mechanica. So I said, the, here are two important things that he did. Of course, he did tons of important things. I just said that, but I just said that before. But for our purposes, there are two things that we need to focus on, two really important things that we need to focus on. Um, so yeah, as I said, the first of these are, um, is the publication of the first volume of his Mechanica in 1736. And in this, he set out a plan for the systematic development of a complete theory of the mechanics of bodies in motion. In this plan, we start from the free motion of point particles and build from there. Um, so the treatment of extended bodies undergoing collisions is a difficult and complex problem that isn't gonna happen until after a lot of other work has been done first. So notice, Collisions may be foundational for Descartes' physics, but they're not for Euler's mechanics. Um, so that's the first important thing. Second important thing, he argued that it's mechanics and not philosophy that provides the general account of bodies. According to Euler, the general properties of bodies are all and only those that are needed for a mechanics of bodies in motion. And in particular, these properties are extension, inertia, and impenetrability. These properties are sufficient for explaining collisions and for arriving at the general rules of collision, according to Euler. So this is a territory grab, an attempt to pull physics out of the philosopher's nest and make it part of the domain of the mathematicians. The philosophers had failed to provide an account of the nature and properties of bodies that was sufficient to give them an adequate theory of collisions, adequate by their own standards, that is. Euler's move is to, to, is to suggest that whatever else philosophers may want to say about bodies, when it comes to bodies in general, to the general properties of bodies, it's mechanics and not philosophy that has the authority to answer that question. So this looks like physics leaving the philosopher's nest and becoming mechanics. 
That's not quite how Euler thought about it, but he certainly made mechanics authoritative over the general properties of bodies. So how should we think about this? Does physics really become just mechanics all of a sudden? And what would that mean for philosophy? Does physics and the sense of the study of bodies in general find a happy home in mechanics? The answer is no, but D'Alembert hoped it would. So take, let's take a quick look at that. D'Alembert is another super interesting figure for philosophers, for philosophers of physics and one where there's a lot more work to do. There's his treatise on dynamics from 1743, his treatise on fluids. Um, he wrote the preliminary discourse to the encyclopedia of Diderot, Diderot and D'Alembert from the mid century, as well as um, loads of entries for the encyclopedia itself. And the encyclopedia was, of course, hugely influential for the 18th century and for the French Enlightenment. And we also have his later book, Elements of Philosophy, and all of his papers, letters, and manuscripts to look at. Um, fortunately for us, um, one of the University of Washington's very own is a D'Alembert expert, Thomas Hankins. Um, so it seems fitting to spend the last part of my talk on D'Alembert. D'Alembert, um, he had a bold picture for the unity of the sciences where everything would be derivable from a single self-evident axiom. More modestly, he thought that if we abstract away from all the messiness of our experiences to the most simple and most general elements, we could begin from there with arithmetic, then geometry, then mechanics. In each case, the objects of our study become more complicated. In moving from geometry to mechanics, we add in the time taken by the motions of bodies and three principles that D'Alembert proposed as the basis of mechanics. His version of the principle of inertia, a rule for the composition of motions and a principle of equilibrium. With this, we have a general theory of bodies in motion, or so hoped D'Alembert. Here is D'Alembert in some notes from late in his life quoted by Hankins. The study of nature is the study of the properties of bodies and their properties depend on two things, their movement and their shape. Thus, the sciences which occupy these two points, that is to say mechanics and geometry, are the two indispensable keys to physics. For D'Alembert, Physics is still all about bodies and their properties. And the way to do physics though, is primarily to do geometry and mechanics. This is what he does in his treatise on dynamics. For all the power and promise of, of D'Alembert's mathematical treatment of problems in mechanics, the difficulty is that you don't get a physics from this. And this is so in two important ways. First, you don't get the kind of physics that the philosophers were looking for, a general account of extended bodies, their nature and properties, an account, and an account of how bodies are capable of acting on one another. This is what philosophers need for all the other projects in philosophy that presuppose the existence of ordinary sized objects and bodies moving around in the world, interacting with one another. D'Alembert's mechanics might hope to deliver that one day, but as of the mid to late 18th century, it's no more than a promissory note. For example, D'Alembert's bodies are perfectly rigid, perfectly uniform regions of extension, largely disconnected from the empirical evidence. Um, I'm talking about the treatise on dynamics here. Um, these are some of the diagrams associated with the problems that he addresses in his treatise on dynamics. At the end of the treatise, D'Alembert has a list of 14 problems that he solves, the last six of which concern collisions. His problems involve perfectly rigid spheres of uniform density, rigid rods, threads that are perfectly non-stretching, they keep exactly um, the same length. And there's no account of how any of these things are possible physically, of how it is physically and materially that a body is extended, how it keeps its shape as it moves around and collides, or how it's possible for bodies to be perfectly rigid. In fact, since we don't have any empirical access to bodies that are perfectly rigid, the more empirically minded physicists at the time excluded the treatment of rigid, rigid bodies from their physics. 
concentrating on bodies that have at least some degree of softness or of elasticity. So d'Alembert's mechanics is a long way from treating the ordinary bodies of our experience. Euler had a program for developing a mechanics that could handle extended bodies, as I mentioned before. And this includes bodies that deform as they move and interact. But it was just that, a program. As of the mid 18th century, mechanics was a very long way from providing an account of the everyday kinds of bodies that the philosophers need. So mechanics is not delivering a physics in the sense of a general account of the nature, properties, powers, and so forth of bodies. We're not getting what we might call a philosophical physics from mechanics. The second way in which D'Alembert's mechanics doesn't give us a physics come from his rejection of, his, comes from his rejection of any explicit appeal to forces. He thought forces were mysterious and unhelpful. And you may remember I mentioned earlier that Leibniz had a complex theory of forces as part of the nature of bodies. And even 60 years after Newton, it was still far from clear what was meant by force. And philosophers used this term to do all sorts of different things. But rejecting any notion of force leaves D'Alembert without the resources to solve the problems he's interested in, except by sneaking in those extra resources, such as by his principle of inertia, or by kind of implicitly helping himself to a notion of mass, to a dynamical notion of mass, that is, something that's um, going to be useful um, for explaining how bodies um, respond um, when they interact with other bodies. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that you can't get from geometry to physics by means of mathematics alone. Even if mechanics includes statics, so you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought, you know, there's the lever and all this kind of thing included in mechanics and doesn't that involve forces so um yes but um even if mechanics does include statics so it does include some notion of force even then it doesn't include enough dynamical resources to build a physics of bodies in motion um d'alembert um drawing on Bernoulli, tried to get there via statics, via ideas from statics. So he likened the head-on collision of two identical, perfectly uniform inelastic spheres to a balance, to an equilibrium situation, and tried to reason from there to a general mechanics. But to even have a chance of making this work, you need a notion of mass and some other resources too. So physics is going to need more resources than the mechanics of the mathematicians had available. It will need additional principles, and these are going to need to be drawn from empirical investigations, as Newton knew, knew all too well. So here's one way to think about this. What mechanics, is, mechanics and the mathematicians doing mechanics have done here is they've liberated physics from presuming that bodies are its subject matter and its starting point. Bodies are complex objects far along in a research program that has to begin with something much simpler, such as freely moving point particles. And the resources from doing, for doing this come from mechanics, not philosophy. Also, since we're not starting with bodies anymore, the criteria for success can't be the ones set by the philosophers who do take bodies as their starting point. So I want to say that philosophy, sorry, I want to say that physics, importantly, so I want to say that physics is now out of the philosopher's nest. But physics isn't just mechanics either, if by that we mean mechanics in the sense of D'Alembert. D'Alembert, as a mathematician, had no obligation to give an account of the materiality of the objects of his mechanics. Those objects are mathematical abstractions, and the criteria for success are the ones for the solution of mathematical problems but the physicist treats physical material objects. And so she will need to figure out her own criteria of success. It's not gonna be those of the mathematicians, but it's now not gonna be those of the philosophers either. This means that we're at an important moment in the emergence of physics as an independent discipline. And what I hope has been clear is the important place that collisions have in this story. So of course, there are all sorts of social and political factors in play um, when disciplines go their separate ways. But if we want to understand the philosophical reasons for and the extent of the separation of physics from philosophy, then we need to pay attention to the 18th century struggles with collisions. <laughs>
the scientific revolution of the 17th century was important, but not enough by itself to separate physics from philosophy. The increased use of mathematics in physics was important, but it's not enough to drive physics out of the philosopher's nest. The success of Newtonian gravitation in the 18th century was important, but physics could have survived that and remained a part of philosophy. Experiment and observation were important, but this fits right in with physics as a part of philosophy. And it was D'Alembert as much as anyone who thought that the need for empirical evidence showed an insufficiency in the principles of the science of bodies. Our conclusion is this, more than anything, it was the failure to find a satisfactory theory of collisions that led to physics flying the philosopher's nest. Thank you. <laughs>